Welcome to Deming Chronicles, where we focus on issues that are current and trending. We speak to persons whose ideas can make a difference to the development of our country. Our aim is to nudge the conversation in the direction of solving some of our wicked problems. We intend to change the conversation because we believe that if you change the conversation, you will change the action. On today's program, we welcome three guests. We welcome Professor Emeritus Patrick Watson. Nice to be here, Denise. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. We also welcome Abby Charles. Thanks for having me, Denise. It's great to be here. And we welcome Dave Williams. Hi, Denise. Good to be with you all today. We'll be back shortly as we lead off on Deming Chronicles. Welcome back. And on this segment, we introduce Professor Emeritus Patrick Watson. We've known him as a professor at the university. We've known him as econometrics, as his master's and his PhD, all number. Welcome to the program. And let's start by asking. Thank you very much, Emeritus. Let's start by asking a big question, a really, really big question. If you had to score the government's performance, on a scale of one to 10, with one being an absolute fail and 10 being absolutely successful. How would you rate the government's performance in terms of governance? Well, I'm, I'm rating the government and not necessarily this one, eh? but the governance, I would give a very low mark. Three would be a very generous mark, but I'll remain at three. And I could justify that if you wish, if you, if you want. Please just try it because you said that you are rating governments and not necessarily this government. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rating governance, governance and the governance and the system because several uh, governments have been involved over the, for, for, let's say, for the 21st century. And I am really going to be looking at that. And what we have had over the years is a steady decline in the quality of institutions. And that is a very, very important part of governance. Police service, the, all the protective forces, the judiciary, the office of the DPP, nothing in the system, the parliament inspires, inspires confidence. There is a singular lack of, of uh, of efficiency in getting things done. Everything takes years to get done. There is a promise of procurement legislation that I have been hearing uh, for a very, very long time. Nothing is happening. There was the creation of a Heritage and Civilization Fund, which was a good thing. Nothing has been added to it over, over many years. And so we find ourselves in a position where we really need to have some money uh, available. And there's only about six billion when there should have been much, much, much more than, than that. There is generally a lack of, I mean, and not to talk about personal safety. Everybody is worried about personal safety. You, and, 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 and with the, the advent of Facebook and the internet, we are seeing some of these things close up online. And in general, we are not being made to feel that we are living in a in a country that is moving that is moving forward which is what good governance would indicate the education system is under serious threat and i'm not even talking about what is happening with the with the with the with the, with the pandemic a lot of people are falling are falling through the the, the cracks and in gen the health system, I mean, two of the things that we have, I mean, I, we all have hospitals in this country as a health service, but if any one of us, I mean, I'm taking a guess, I'm sure it's about true about you, Denise, it's true about me too. Unless there is something that has to be done that cannot be done elsewhere, I will not be going into any of the hospitals here to have anything done to me. And in fact, prime ministers say the same thing, more or less, because they go abroad uh, for, for treatment. And I'm not talking about Dr. Warrior alone. Uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Manning went to Cuba. Uh, Mr. Pandey went to England, I think, and, 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 and other places. 
we have not been doing very well in, in, in governance. And as a consequence, we are trending more and more towards what people will call a failed state. And COVID-19 is not going to help us. Eh? COVID-19 is going to make things worse. And the worst thing to have in a situation like that is a government in which you have no confidence. And that is what poor governance uh, causes. If you were happy, let's take the property tax and as an example. Everybody, I, I don't think anybody doesn't want to pay that. People are afraid that they are not going to get value for money. People believe, and since, since the Axi tax, in fact, this was the case, that the government spent its money badly, and here they are now trying to make money from some other source. If you know how a property tax is, is run in, in other countries, like England, the equivalent in England, it's a tax that is done within a local community, and the funds are used for the benefit of that local community. These uh, funds will go into the into the consolidated fund and be used generally. So in, in that sense, it's not really going to be a, a, a property tax except in, in name. So we have a general situation of the at local government level, at, certainly at national government level, where people are not satisfied with the delivery of service and it is not seeming to get, to, to get better. What we can do is if we make comparisons over time, I mean, Singapore and Trinidad and Tobago became independent around the same time. If you look at what is going on in Singapore, what is going on in Malaysia, I'm just call it two, <laughs> two countries like that, or even uh, in the Caribbean, we may be able to squeeze in Barbados as, a, a, as an example of relatively, of, of relatively good governance. We can see that we are way behind in all of We have been lucky because we have had money in the form of oil, that, that especially over the, in, in this century, we have had quite a bit of it. And we still have money outstanding that is due to the oil. Of course, that, that's another issue because that money is shrinking. Day by day, the funds that we have are getting lesser, and there is no hope of anything coming to fill it. The price of oil is not rising, and even if it did rise, we have production levels that are very, very low. So we are not going to be going very far, very fast. Professor, you have painted a picture of absolute doom and gloom. If yes. you... If you could change just one thing or two things, if you could take some action that could just be a point of inflection before we change a direction, what would you what would you do? One of the things we must do and ought to have done a long time ago is diversify this economy, not into a hundred different products but into things that can earn for an exchange. We ought to have done that before I was born. And in fact, they were speaking about it before I was born. But oil has always intervened to make us drop the idea. Every time the oil goes bad, we, we talk about diversification. As soon as the oil prices rise, we change our minds. We don't talk about it anymore. In fact, there was one prime minister who made you believe implicitly that God is always going to give us oil. And that, that, that was very, very unfortunate. But he complained that since the turn of the 20th century, people were saying that oil would disappear. And yes, it may not disappear, but what is happening? People are finding alternative sources of energy now. People are finding also alternative sources of oil, the fracking and the shale oil and all, all these kinds of things, which is making our own oil less demanded abroad. But in, even then, in the meanwhile, our oil, the, our oil production is falling. So the, the day is upon us. And even if the oil price should shoot up to $150 tomorrow, we will not be able to benefit as, say, Guyana may be able to, because we are not producing the quantities that we, we produced uh, uh, about five or six years ago. We are below 100,000 barrels a day, and it doesn't seem to be going much higher than 60,000, which is a, a record. Because since I was a child, I always knew we were in the hundreds, and mm -hmm. to go below the, the hundred is, is 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 very very bad. So it's not in our favor anymore. When I say oil, I really mean oil and gas as as, yes. as well. Yes. We are talking about fossil fuel. But let me be specific oh. about diversification because that is a word that we have bandied about for as long as, as you said, before you and I were born. Well, what, what does that mean and how could we 
All right. I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it must mean. It cannot mean that I go into a business that requires the use of foreign exchange alone. If I go into a, a, an activity, it must be able to generate foreign exchange. It may use, but it must generate more than it uses. Countries like ours depend on foreign exchange. You look around you, you look at anything on, that you're wearing, and it's foreign exchange. The minute we don't have foreign exchange, we are going to be in a serious problem. Foreign exchange is the lifeblood of a country like Trinidad and Tobago because its own currency <laughs> is not demanded abroad. We have to earn a currency that people will want to have. So if we want to buy eggs from Hong Kong, they will settle for the Chinese yuan. They will settle for the US dollar. They will settle for the euro. But they are not going to take the Trinidad and Tobago dollar. So we must earn for an exchange that can help us purchase things from abroad. A small country like ours just does not have the resources to provide everything that we need. And we have already become accustomed to our lifestyle where everything we do is foreign exchange. So we have to find the means of earning those foreign, the, the foreign exchange that we need to live. Now, when to identify a product is not so straightforward. In fact, <clears throat> What I suggest and have suggested and based on research that we have done is that we have to finance innovation. We have to spend money on think tanks, on getting, on spending it on, on people who come up with ideas, sometimes crazy ideas, to see what it can give. You may be able to say, well, we could go into to something like the, the, yacht, the yacht services and anything like that. These things appear to be obvious, but many a time they are not. Sometimes what is most obvious is not the real thing at all. When you study the history of a country like, like Finland, Finland was a woodcutting country up to a few years ago. And because they acquired skills along the way in woodcutting, which included using electronic items, they went into the making eventually, and at one time were the leaders in the making of cellular phones, the, the Nokia. Now, when and nobody planned to do the Nokia. Eh? That, that happened because of the skills that were acquired. We, over the years, have acquired a lot of skills, let's say, from the petroleum sector, including accounting skills, including administrative skills, which we can use not only in the petroleum sector elsewhere, but in other uh, energy sectors and in other high-tech sectors all, all over the world. We may be able to guide our our production of goods and services and perhaps more services than goods in a direction of, of that. I'm not saying that that is the case. Eh? What I'm trying to say to you is that we may not know what is going to save us. What we have to do and what we ought to have done many years ago, but we didn't do it. Eh? But if you didn't do it when it ought to have been done, the second best time is always now. It has to begin now. Now, Diversification based on innovation and, and entrepreneurship is an expensive business. Eh? If you read the stories that Elon Musk will tell you about these things, you say that if you have not lost so much money, you have not really done anything. That is how it, it, it works. You lose a lot of money to win a lot, a lot of money. Unfortunately, we are in a phase where losing money is not a pleasant idea. We, when we were getting the money in, in larger quantities, then is when we should have invested in it. But I think we still have enough foreign exchange in Trinidad and Tobago to take some chances. We have about $13 billion in reserves, two of which are borrowed. Eh? So it's roughly about 11. I'm counting the Heritage and Civilization Fund because my own suspicion is that we cannot avoid using that in the, in the, in, in, in the near future. And it is not a bad idea to apportion a large amount of that, well, a fairly substantial part of it, to finance innovation and to see to what extent ideas can lead to, to, to output of products of, of, of goods and services. The obvious is not always the best thing to do. I always mention when people try to tell me, well, we have methanol, we could do plastics because it seems to be that's the next part of the chain. I say Paris does not produce cloth. 
neither does New York, but they are the centers of fashion. You understand? That is, that is, that, that is how it goes. You don't have to be living next to the thing that you are that, 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 that you are going to use. We could use things that require a lot of imports. <laughs> I always give the example. Suppose like, like France, we were able to, to, let's say, brand doubles. Deming's doubles, all right? That's a big thing. Anybody who wants to buy doubles in New York, it must be Deming's doubles. There on. Now, we could sell doubles all over the world under the branded name of Deming because that's what people know as doubles. Martinique is trying to do that, by the way, in the, with their rum. They are, they are trying to brand their rums so that people could drink a Martinique, you see? And, 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 and that's, that's the idea. So anybody could make doubles. But if you manage to brand a name, like how the Jamaicans did it by the way with their patties. Yes. The, yes. the juicy, the juicy patties, I think it's called. People yes. seek yes. those out in New York, eh? And they want it from Jamaica. You know what is the funny thing about doubles and patty? Not a bit of the ingredients that go into it come from Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago. Maybe the bandania and, <laughs> and, and, and things like that. But the 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 the, the barra. Which is made from um, uh, from important stuff. It's made from important stuff. Yeah. But, but, um, Professor Watson, there are a couple of things that that you have raised. You've raised yeah. the issue of changing our energy sources. So, for instance, you've talked about using solar or using fracking or other yeah. approaches to fossil fuel. You've also talked about diversification, and you've been very specific about diversification in talking about the fact that the ingredients need not come from Trinidad. So as we wrap this interview, what do you think the citizens should be looking at to determine if our governance is improving? One of the biggest concerns we have, even outside of COVID, is health. But we are also concerned about our safety. We are Many of us are leaving this country because we feel unsafe. You speak to anybody who has had an incident. I had a, a, a young friend, former student of mine. He got robbed of his cell phone while running, and it was traumatic because he didn't know if his life could have been taken. That's a traumatic experience. And in his own mind, he's thinking, well, I, I can't stay here anymore. You know, that, that's, it, it, it's, it's a frightening thing. So personal safety is of vital importance. With the COVID, we want to make sure, I, I mean, we always need help, but with COVID around, we need to make sure that that is there as well. I think if we manage to make ourselves safe, just to start with, because a lot of the things I spoke to you about, about entrepreneurs doing activity here, many of them wouldn't want to stay if they cannot feel secure in, the, in, in, in themselves. Eh? Personal safety is a big plus. If you could walk the streets without being mugged, if you can feel safe when you lie down in your bed, that nobody's going to break into your house, if you don't feel like you have to lock up yourself sometimes at a risk with burglar proofing, when I say a risk, if a fire breaks out, yes. some people get caught in, 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 inside. These are not nice things. People are afraid to have their children walk in the streets to go by a neighbor. All of these things are frightening things. Nobody wants to live like that. So you're living in communities, and as what Edwin said a years ago, we live in, in jail. I don't know if you remember that kind of that I remember kind of that kind of that. So, and on that note, <laughs> yeah. Professor Watson, we live in, in jail. The fact that you reference the need for personal safety as something that is an indicator that citizens should have for governance. Thank you ever so much for being part of Deming Chronicles. Thank Up you. next, we'll have Abby Charles. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Deming Chronicles, and with us is Abby Charles. Welcome, Abby. How are you today? I am doing wonderfully. Uh, I wish I was at home in warm weather, but nonetheless, I'm doing well. How are you yeah. doing, Denise? I'm very well, thank you, Abby. And, you know, I know you as the energy behind Benny Karim. Tell I me, am. what inspired that? 
Yeah, well, when I founded Bene Karim, I was living in the States and I was actually moving back to Trinidad for about a year and a half. And as I was in transition from my employment, I was trying to think, you know, what would be something that I could start as a business? Um, I've always worked in nonprofit and working in nonprofit, I've never really had the excessive disposable income to be able to donate to organizations and to um, the, you know, entities that I see as doing good in the Caribbean and, and otherwise or in the Caribbean diaspora. And I wanted to find a way to generate revenue to be able to do those types of donations. So I was, you know, in this mindset of, all right, I'm moving back home. I want to start a business. What type of business would I want to start? And, you know, a social enterprise was what was at the forefront of my mind, something whereby I would be able to generate some revenue, be able to support employment uh, in my community in Trinidad, uh, be able to donate to organizations, or at least to highlight the stories of organizations that are doing great work in the Caribbean. And you see, living in Washington, D.C., sometimes the narrative that you receive from Trinidad is very similar to what you were just talking about with Patrick in that you hear some negative um, narratives around crime, around um, quote unquote laziness. You hear so many negative narratives, but I know that the reality is very different to that on the ground and that there is so much good work happening in the Caribbean as well, right? There's so many nonprofits that are doing quality work, uh, you know, organizations that are supporting children, organizations that are supporting the development of the steel pan, organizations across the gamut. Um, and mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to highlight that work to the broader diaspora through so fashion. Mm -hmm. So tell us, tell us something about the kinds of products that Ben & Carey produces. Yeah, so specifically, we are a fashion brand. So we produce uh, clothing uh, that is uh, low waste or no waste. So we try to keep all of our scraps and we use those scraps to do jewelry and accessories to make sure that we're not contributing to waste in the earth. Um, but aside from that, it's primarily a fashion brand. Uh, right now we produce primarily fashion for women, uh, but we are trying to expand to do more for uh, people who identify um, or who want to see more masculine like pieces um but you know to be gender neutral is also something that we are working towards as well so we could produce clothing for people who identify in whatever way they want to um but right now we primarily design clothing for women and how has the market responded to your designs and to your offerings yeah well you know i was amazed when we launched we launched in 2015 and i was amazed at how quickly uh, we sort of took off. We were sort of immediately in two different stores in Trinidad after our launch within a month. Um, and there was a high demand from my international customers for pieces as well. So we started with a website um, and started shipping internationally from Jump. Um, and there was quite, in, quite a lot of interest for our pieces because we tried to really embody what I see as a Caribbean aesthetic in my mind. So we use fabrics from the Caribbean, we use batiks, we use uh, bright colors that represent the essence of the people, the rhythms, the energy of the Caribbean uh, in our pieces. And, you know, surprisingly, uh, even as I've moved back to the States, the demand is still there, uh, which I, I'm, I'm truly pleased by. Uh, some of the pieces we're trying to do better is telling that story of um, why we were founded, telling the story of the good in the Caribbean, which is what Bene Carib means, so that we can attract even more of an audience. Because uh, globally now, we know that people want to see that they are purchasing with a purpose. They want to know that the brands they are buying from have strong values as well. So there's interest there. We just need to make sure that we are meeting the market where they are at. And what a lovely name. Good in the Caribbean, good from the Caribbean, Caribbean good, Benny Carey. <laughs> what a wonderful play on some of the aesthetics and mm -hmm. some of those theories and those notions that will help us to be more productive. What do you see as some of the backward linkages between your products and the and where you produce it? What are some of those? Could you explain some of those backward linkages to us? 
Yeah, when you say backward, tell me what you mean by backward yeah, linkages. What I mean by that is that where do you get your, your raw materials? How right. are you sourced? Who helps you? For instance, if you're doing a batik piece, the right. backward linkage to that is who's producing that and what yeah, is it yeah. requiring? Yeah. And, and through this, you're talking to some of the challenges with sourcing in the Caribbean in that, you know, because we do not produce fabrics, we import so many of our fabrics for our pieces. Um, so whether I am getting them up here, because the goal for Bene Carib as well is to move to be as sustainable as a brand as possible, which means using organic cottons or recycled fabrics, which presently is very difficult to source in Trinidad. Um, so most of our fabrics come from abroad, but my batiks are done in Trinidad by hand by a phenomenal artist named um, Don Seeley. So he does our batik art and we've worked with other local designers, all Trinidadian thus far, as we've designed our jewelry and our other pieces with those fabrics um, or accessories as well. Um, so, but all of our production takes place in Trinidad. Uh, we work with, well, I work with a, a tailor. Um, so I know exactly how my pieces are being made, how people are being treated. Um, and, you know, it, it's very a small shop. So we also are slow made. We're not making hundreds of pieces that are just going to waste in the environment either. Uh, but it is very much so a made in Trinidad brand. Um, and we are, you know, there are a couple of designers in Trinidad who are very interested in seeing the Caribbean go back to where we were when we produced some of the best cotton in the world. Um, that would be a space to be in where if we could truly be generating the fabrics out of bamboo, out of cotton, high quality fabrics in Trinidad, we could eliminate so much of our carbon footprint by importing all of these fabrics. So when we think about becoming more um, sustainable as a country, uh, we might want to look at uh, fa fabrics as one of those diversi diversification areas from an economic standpoint as well. Uh, but right now, a lot of brands are importing most of their raw materials to produce um, and I know that's a challenge for small fashion brands as they are trying to be competitive on the international market. Uh, their costs have to be so much higher because of those those other supply chain issues. So, yeah. and, and Abby, you've just raised two absolutely phenomenal areas, fabric that could be made from bamboo and revitalization of our cotton industry where we used to plant. We used to grow cotton and we used to actually weave cotton. Just the thought of those two areas is just phenomenal. But I just wanted to wrap this interview on a question about your price point. How does that, what is the competitive environment that exists around your price point that you bring to your consumers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to consciously not price our pieces at the prices that usually fashion brands would charge. So, you know, there's a behind the scenes formula for how you price your pieces. Um, but if we were to use those prices, our prices would be exorbitant for our market. So we have to be really conscious that we, we definitely need to make revenue to support the business. But at the same time, we have to keep our prices at a decent enough price that respects the artistry behind our batiks and respects the artistry of our tailoring, the design that goes into it by me as well, and our staff. Um, but at the same time, ensure that our pieces are actually being purchased. Uh, so we look across the market at different independent uh, labels that are coming out of the Caribbean to price our pieces. Um, on the international market, I would say we are very competitive as well from a price perspective. Um, the, the key is that from a Carib as a Caribbean brand, across all of our Caribbean designers, we truly have to brand the quality that comes out of the Caribbean so that we begin to be valued internationally. You know, fashion traditionally has been somewhat Euro-centered. Um, the values around what is fashion and what is fashionable does not necessarily take into, the Car take into account the Caribbean aesthetic. And we have to uh, really highlight the value that fashion from the Caribbean brings in order to ensure that whatever we price our pieces at, the quality is valued internationally. And on that note, the pricing and the quality and the Bene Carib 
Good Caribbean, Caribbean good on that note. Thank you very much, Abby. Next up, we'll have Dave Williams. Deming Chronicles, we'll be back shortly. Deming Chronicles, welcome back. And our next guest, Dave Williams. I know he's accustomed to a big stage. I know he's accustomed to a lot of movement. But we have a studio interview with Dave Williams, who's a creative consultant. And I just want to start this interview by asking you, Dave, what brings you joy? <laughs> oh, gee, and I told you not to ask me that, you know. Um, what brings me joy? Joy is something that I, I think is really difficult to explain that, um, you know, I have to go find a meaning of it to really address that question. But I'm not... I, I don't believe I spend my time pursuing joy. Um, however, what I believe brings me a sense of awareness of, you know, my circumstance, my situation, I find that those things kind of fulfilling. And sometimes th those are not things that make, uh, bring great happiness, but to be actually in the trenches of my own existence, I find to um, be where I would in the moment, in the moment of my life um, and trying to be in the moment of the lives of others as well. Um, mm -hmm. I find I feel most alive. Um, mm -hmm. Joy seems to me a bit kind of something that I would, when I was young, I was um, looking for. Okay. And it's because I find joy in everything, which is why mm -hmm. I asked that hard, hard, hard question. Mm -hmm. Dave, another hard question. Oh, what value, what's the value of artists to society? Well, um, in um, your previous interview, um, your first one, the, there was talk of innovation and, of course, diversification and innovation and all of these things have been threading through the discussion. And um, one of the centers of innovation in a society is um, is art. The arts and sciences sciences are where we mostly find our innovation, and and we live with it on a continuous and ongoing, and we struggle to find it on a continuous and ongoing basis. Meaning that you try to find things that are uh, you constantly questioning and sometimes upending traditional ideas, ways of seeing, ways of doing, and you that's what you live with trying to do. Um, so it's you destroy and create and destroy and create and destroy and create, not in the sense that people think of destruction, but in... Um, so I think that where maybe um, our society has left the arts behind because we think of it as, you know, those creative people over there or whatever, artsy people over there, um, we've also left our big, the biggest part of our research and development function, the R&D of our society has been forgotten. Um, and so uh, words become platitude, um, diversification. We all know since we were in school, children, we have to diversify and that, it means nothing anymore. And saying it means nothing anymore. So we have to, like artists, figure out now what, how do we communicate about getting to different spaces because um, it is true that we've had different governments and um, or different people governing but the same governance and it's because there has been for want of a better word no radical approach to anything um, we continue in the same way of treating um, our society and each other and we um, we don't take it's the art department, the art and sciences department, have been left behind. Um, so w if we could try to um, go invest in, in, in arts and sciences, maybe we can restructure and um, re-load um, meaning into some terms or to get rid of them 
or Entirely. I just want to challenge you on saying that the arts and sciences have been left behind because this society produces several doctors and that's part of the science stream. So yeah. could, could you just give me a little bit of explanation of what do you mean by that? Um, I, gosh, Denise, this is, is tricky. Producing several doctors, um, it's that you are people are coming out of a system that qualifies people. And there in in that in those systems, there is a degree of um, not safety, should I say, um, that you have people um, admitting people to the canon of who um, the people that we should take our lead from. And so in there and um, in perpetuating that system, um, and particularly maybe in a small country, uh, you may not be doing the, 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 the um, upending and the recreating and the questioning and et cetera, that um, I think that, uh, so we could, we, and with gate and stuff, and a lot of education and we're producing more doctors than we ever had but we feel more lost than we ever were so how you know where what was was the question and answer in that yeah. so but you, you talked about us feeling more lost than we ever were mm -hmm. if you had a magic wand and could upend your word the system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and put create creative arts and creativity more to the forefront what would you do I would really begin to challenge and invest in the artists, the um, some of the established and emerging artists that we have really challenge them. And likewise, our scientists, people making stuff, um, finding new ways to do new products, um, challenge and reward. Um, of late, the discussion, of course, um, with particularly aided by this virtual carnival thing, and that the term creatives, which you know that I despise, um, the creatives and the creatives want and the creatives want and the creatives want and they want more. Um, this is, there's so many angles to come at that. But arts and the patronage of arts and sciences back um, all the way, Da Vinci, all of those people, um, they had been funded either by the state or by wealthy people. Um, and the arts, you need to, the risk that artists are supposed to take should um, not have them relying or depending so heavily on where's my salary coming from because um, then we get to where artists and governments and artists and institutions and establishments are in bed together and then you don't find the radical innovation and invention that it, that can produce the most value and on that on that issue of value mm -hmm. how do you change a mindset related to valuing artists in a country that takes art for granted i mean there's just a kind of side note for me and that is big artists people who sing they do like maybe one or two releases per year if so frequently we require at, at least in the past we require that our our singers our soccer artists our calypsonians that they constantly produce and they produce five and ten releases for the year so what mm -hmm. the real question is how do we change the mindset to put a different value a positive value on our artists um well that has to do with that 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 um meaningless uh, idea of diversification of the industry because our carnival requires that we, you know, you pay how much money for a costume, you may put it on, you wear it, you throw it away. Um, so the carnival, while it produces a good degree of a high degree, an intense degree of creativity, we have to now find other ways to shunt some of that off into um, more long term ideas and results. And um, it may sound vague, but because I don't know how to do it, but um, 
the professor spoke about to th the think, think, think so. tanks. I'm trying to do my THs because I know you <laughs> can use that. THs, the think tank. tank. It has more no A's in the tank. Think tank. Yeah, <laughs> the think tank. Um, right. um, to start to really kind of um, get those going, putting those to work on the festival and now with questions of virtual carnival because the world has um i always say do yourself before the world does you and with covid covid came along and did us because we weren't doing ourselves and we have the perfect opportunity to now upend all the things that we were thinking about or, or practicing or being so it is moments like this that i believe that artists are, are, are trained for to um we eat this is food um the challenges artists don't maybe do very well when everything is running hunky dory um but now we don't know our proverbial from our elbows um it's a good moment because the definitions have shifted so how we start to create value on what those values are and how we assign um, dollar value um, and the impact, the impact that work has on the society, how we assess and we push and promote that, all of it is now up for, um, is now at question together with governance as well the way we govern carnival the way we govern ourselves the way we our agency our own agency to make mass um like in the beginning of carnival before the 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 the, the um festival was so um commodified the agency of the individual was a powerful thing and that had the value so um you know there's so many things uh that we have to look at and it's an exciting and i guess joyous time because <laughs> we get we get to put our our mind to work and people will say all the time that you're overthinking but i say i respond it's free thinking is so is so it's cheap and it's free and yeah. it's, we have an opportunity to mm -hmm. rethink the joy that our carnival used to bring us yeah. and redesign it in a way that we could commodify it. And I'm not sure that you will be with me on the commodification of carnival. But my, my takeaway as we wrap this edition of them in Chronicles has to do with let us play us. And let us redesign, let us reimagine, let us have a carnival in which the artist is at the center and the artist helps us to bring joy to our lives. On that note, thank you very much, Dave Williams, thank for you. being part of Deming Chronicles. Join us again for another edition for Deming Chronicles. And until then, be safe. Thank you.